Production funding for Ruckus has been provided by gifts from Dave and Jamie Cummings, The Hartwig Family, Hush Blackwell, Barbara and Peter Gattermeyer, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to Ruckus, our weekly food for thought fight over the news of the day and the trends of the times. I'm Mike Shannon. The Ruckettes join me shortly. Our topics this week, will a new plan for KCI fly? Critics call a vote fraud commission fraudulent, and the Missouri legislature calls it quits, plus roast and toast. But we start with our newsmaker segment and talk about the future of streetcars in Kansas City. As you know, news coverage of the streetcars has typically been positive, with rave reviews for the streetcars' impact on downtown, particularly in terms of convenience and economic development. Plans are now underway to extend the system from Union Station south to the plaza and UMKC. Not everyone is enthralled by streetcars or in favor of extension. Here to talk about the other side of the streetcar story is Sherry DeJanes, a local attorney. Sherry, thanks for joining us and welcome to Ruckus. Glad to be here. Thank you for having me. Tell us how you first got involved in this battle and what prompted your involvement. I first got involved in 2013 when I learned of the phase two expansion efforts. And uh, I live in Brookside. I love the trail there. And my neighbors go, wait a minute, you need to know what's going on. So they got me involved in a meeting. I went to the meeting. I asked some questions. I felt like I wasn't getting very good answers. So I started looking into the whole issue much more deeply. And when I learned that the financing was going to be through special assessments, which would hit nonprofits, I really uh, started looking into things and, and how what impact that was going to have on the nonprofits along all of those lines. The other issue that really uh, stirred my ire was the 1% sales tax. It's a regressive tax. It was going to, at that time, uh, have a huge impact on many people who couldn't afford it. So I got involved. We defeated it in 2014. We naively thought that might, that might be the end yeah. of it. but. When the mayor announced that night that, no, no. we're going to keep going, we knew we had more to and, fight. And you've been involved in a petition campaign to get an issue on the ballot involving streetcars. What is the issue? The issue is that if the city is going to spend our money planning, uh, buying land, doing anything with respect to um, streetcar expansion, that it needs to be put to a citywide vote, not just a district vote, which is what we have going on now. And, and so that question will be on the city's August ballot? That's correct. And if it succeeds, then there would be no future expansion of streetcars without a citywide vote that approves the expansion? Correct, if city money is going to go into the well, project. What about this current project, the expansion from Union Station to the plaza and UMKC, is that, that's going on the ballot, is it not? Well, it's a mail-in ballot. Yeah. And if you haven't requested your application for ballot by 5 p.m. on May 23rd, you're not going to get to vote in the formation piece of that. Uh, you not only have to get that uh, request for ballot in, you've also got to prove uh, that you are registered yeah. to vote and submit that by the and, and live in the area that's affected by the extension. Exactly. And it's called a transportation development district, and it is a form of election that's not entirely democratic, some people say. Well, it's, uh, I call it a stealth <laughs> election. I think it's absolutely beyond the pale. Missouri has a mail-in ballot um, act and pursuant to that, you've got to get permission from the election authority. You then have the election authority send the ballots out to the people. They don't have to go and request them. It doesn't require that you provide proof of voter registration. And it uh, is a much more streamlined and, thing. And a relatively small number of people can decide the turnout of the election, the results of the election. As we saw downtown, yeah. it was fewer than 500 people. Sherry, as I mentioned in the, in the introduction, most of the coverage of the streetcars has been very positive. The idea that this has brought people downtown, caused businesses to have more customers and encouraged businesses to locate downtown. Do you disagree with those premises? I don't necessarily disagree with them. I disagree with what has really been uh, at the heart of it. If you take a look at the development, you're going to see that there's tax increment financing or tax abatement or some com combination of the two attached to every, almost every project down there. I know of two that do not have that kind of 
incentivizing going on behind it. But it's if you had a BRT with permanent stations, you're going there. There's empirical evidence that you're going to see that kind of What's development. What's a BRT? I'm sorry, bus rapid transit, which is something that we really promote. The Max is sort of a watered down version of that, but um, it has its own traffic control. Sometimes it will have its own lane of traffic. It's got more permanent structures for stations, and it operates uh, along the lines of a max. Got to stop you there. One final question. Did you ever ride the streetcar? No. Are you going to? I don't think so. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming in. Pleasure to meet you, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing what happens on these projects. Glad you could have me here. Thank you. That is attorney Sherry DeJanes. Now let's meet the panel and start a ruckus. <laughs> Lisa Johnston is a consultant and columnist. Ron Freeman is a former Kansas GOP official and now a motivational speaker. Cynthia Wheeler is a marketing strategist. And Woody Kozad is a Jefferson <laughs> City survivor <laughs> and head of the Kozad Company, a government relations firm. Well, it has been apparent for months, maybe years, that the civic, business, and political leadership of Kansas City wants a new one-terminal airport. What is also apparent is that many residents of the area don't share that conviction. The latest development is a plan from Burns & McDonald, a prominent engineering firm and frequent recipient of city contracts, to privately finance the building of a new $1 billion one-terminal airport at no apparent cost to taxpayers. The city would own and operate the airport. Burns and McDonald would receive airport revenues. The sudden announcement caught many by surprise, including some council members who are said to be skeptical. So, Cynthia, are you skeptical <laughs> as well? Well, I think um, if I am to be skeptical, it's that I'm disappointed in how the plan was, you know, how all of this was rolled out. But I think from the production um, standpoint, it looks really good. I spoke this morning with the team at KCI, Joe McBride and the management, and they support the city's efforts. Um, and, but they too expressed concern that the optics are not real good. And I certainly understand those individuals who think that we are lacking um, more detailed information, but it's a great option. It's happening nationally. You've got people internationally who have airports that were built on private sector money, and if it brings us funding, moves us into a first-tier city, then we should be excited about it. Uh, Woody, is this simply an act of <coughs> civic concern by Burns and McDonald, or does that company uh, stand to have a long-term, somewhat <laughs> lucrative deal? Of course they do. Um, no airport's going to cost taxpayers money. It's always paid for by the revenues of the airport. So that hasn't changed anything. They, what they want to do, and I, look, I'm generally in favor of this kind of thing. As Cynthia says, a lot of it's been going on in Europe for a long time. Air service there's a lot better. They've got a lot more competition. Um, but what I don't understand is why Burns and Mac will build the airport, get the revenue, that will pay off whatever they have to borrow to build the airport, and the city alone and operate it. This, this is one of the worst managed cities in America. Why do we want them to operate the airport? This is an opportunity to, to do something else with it. So I'd prefer a private operator when it's all over with and it's built uh, to having the city do it. If the public is got to be involved, in 100 miles of Kansas City, there are 4 million people who use this airport. Why the 460 or 80,000 people in Kansas City, Missouri, decide the fate of the airport uh, is kind of a mystery to me. So I think there's some, yeah. if we're going to do this, let's get some real long-term change out of it rather than just saying, oh, we'll pass the revenue through Burns and Mac instead of through the city. Uh, how long will Burns mm -hmm. and Mac get the revenues? Is there an expiration date? Till they, till they uh, pay off. Memorandum uh, yeah. of understanding. Yeah. So. Till but they the pay plan off is that. no different uh, okay, from the before, one issued on April 26th. Right. Ron, before this becomes a reality, uh -huh. there has to be a vote by the city council and the vote, uh -huh. as Woody was suggesting, by voters in Kansas City, Missouri. That's pretty steep hill to climb, is it not? Well, it's been and the devil or an angel is in the details here. <laughs> Because we don't know. I mean, it's gonna, it costs the city, excuse me, <clears throat> servicing that debt's going to be $85 million a year. Last year's revenue is $57 million. We have a problem. <clears throat> so prices are going to go up. They're talking about maybe as much as a 70% increase. That's for travelers. 
and, uh, yep. that's and that's costly. Yeah, but, and that's the thing that I want to know more about. Yeah. I'm I'm tired of all the hedging about what the impact is really going to be here because there's no free lunch and there's no four dollar a person brand new airport. Right. We need to know what's going to happen with ticket prices. There was some suggestion that Burns and Mac may get a uh, sales tax on sales at the airport and we need to know the real impact of the convenience level they keep talking about number of steps well i want to know amount of time <laughs> yes. you know as a johnson county resident i use the airport frequently and so the flyers are the ones going to be shouldering the cost right. we need to know right. what the well, cost yeah. is both in terms of money and in terms of convenience and time but when we're talking about time and money for the flyers, it's not just the Missouri folks that use it. It is That's Kansas. Right. It sure. is Nebraska. It right. is Iowa. We have other st other people well, who come in and use it. Well, that's true of sports yeah, arenas I mean, and, 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 other and, and other venues. And we generate and, revenue from the well, taxes. Well, we don't have regional we, elections. Yeah, but we generate but taxes well, from those right. individuals who <laughs> come in. No, stop. Why does Kansas, West Jackson <laughs> County have to pay for the sports uh, complex yeah. with no help from the Jokos, who are 70% of the butts in the seats at but, a But they pay the sales tax when they go there. They, they buy the they, tickets, they, they do all that. No, but no one forced I'm Jackson for County voters election to do it. They chose and, to do it. And I must talk to different Johnson Countyans than Steve Rose because a lot of the folks I talk to. He talks to rich Johnson <laughs> County. Yeah, right. There. Yeah. Well, I talk, I talk to some rich ones too, but a lot of them have concerns. They, they, feel, all rich? I don't know. they feel the airport <laughs> is convenient and they're not sold on the amount of money it's going to take yeah. to do this. From the very the beginning, from Van Lowe, they have every step of the way. The one thing they have failed to do is get out ahead with information Thank that you, you want to hear yes. about Absolutely. the airport plan. Yeah. Absolutely. Our, our airport works. You don't need to fix it. That's about well, it. I, I, I disagree. A, <laughs> <laughs> I disagree. I remember a Steve Kraske column a few years ago where he says every mayor wants a big ticket yeah. project right. during his or her term. Sure. And he cited some examples. I think it's generally true. Is this what Sly James wants as his legacy? A, a I, I won't make that call. Airport? I mean, it could be, but I, I don't know. Obviously, he's got a motor. He wants to get it done. So why? I, I, well, I don't know. There's I was a like, lot, there's a do lot we of, do something or not do something? The, there's well, a lot. I think that's that, where the debate has to be. Well, we that's where, that and, debate, and people need to be involved with that. Right, what absolutely. is convenient, but are we telling them the story behind the scenes? I mean, at one point we had a robust airport. All three terminals were packed all the yep. time. There's <clears> got to be a reason that airlines are running away, and people well, don't see. they're going away from regional. They're yeah, going right. longer haul. And, and that, are we that being told that? No, absolutely. And, and yeah. Mayor James said the other day the airlines are, are getting weary of this, and if something doesn't happen soon, they're looking at Omaha uh, and no, Wichita. I think that's an empty and threat. Even and talking to yeah. Johnson County. Empty threat. If there's All money right. to we're be made, they're going to be empty here. Threat. Terminals. here. Here's a <laughs> non, <laughs> yeah. yeah. non empty threat. We've got to move on to the next one. For the first time in eight years, the Missouri Republican Party controls not only both houses of the legislature, but also the office of governor. Eric Greitens, the outsider candidate, won the GOP nomination, soaring to victory in the fall election, defeating Chris Coster, then state attorney general. On May 12th, as required by law, the Missouri legislative session came to a close with control of the Missouri House and Senate and the governor's office. One might think that Republicans got just about everything they wanted. So Woody, did they? Well, they got a lot of it. Yeah. Uh, the, they passed right to work right out of the boat. Uh, they, there's an under-the-table deal that nobody admits to here uh, that, that basically the Democrats fought hard enough to let the unions see them fighting. The union strategy is to put it on the ballot in, in, in anyway. 2018. So, right. And in return for that, the Democrats didn't stand up all that much on the tort reform stuff. Uh, and I represent the, uh, the trial lawyers, and a bunch of the tort reform stuff went through. Um, and it, some of it is not very important and some of it is very significant. But, you know, that's what they ran on. We're going to do tort reform. We're going to do right to work. And they did it. And they did it despite having a pretty chaotic session in the Senate. But I don't know why a legislature is <coughs> supposed to be calm and, you know, yeah. uh, run like a railroad. And uh, all in all, they delivered mostly on what they said they'd deliver on. Uh, Cynthia, Woody said that uh, Republicans delivered on what they said they would. Uh, critics say that Greitens ran on ethics reform and nothing on that question happened. This is true. It's one of the reasons I thought he might be a great candidate. However, aside from that, education didn't happen. 
Um, we have some infrastructure issues. What do you mean education didn't happen? Fully funded it for the first time yeah. in several well, years. Uh, yeah, let me correct myself on Nixon that. I'm never thinking did that Kansas. Day. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> education happened, but I just don't think the issue regarding dark money um, and all these challenges facing us for infrastructure were addressed. Uh, let me ask over here, did the legislature succeed in blocking Kansas City from voting on a higher minimum wage? Well, that's a good question. I mean, they certainly gave took, that impression took a, that that was achieved. Took a step that they're trying to, you know, create that impression that they want to set it at a lower bar. Now, of course, there are lots of folks who have concerns about that because they want everyone to have a wage that they can actually live on, a living wage. And so there's a lot of fractiousness about whether or not that was an appropriate step. Is this anti-worker? Is this anti-middle class? Well, Woody, you were there. What exactly happened on on the question of cities being able to override the, the state's level of yeah. minimum wage. You know, I, at the end of the session, I'm not concerned with that issue. I don't have a client on that issue, so I wasn't paying, I'll be frank, I wasn't paying much attention. I thought they were going to get it through I, I at think the, the, the state preempted the, the cities from voting on the, it. Uh, and, you know, they've closed, there was an article in the Wall Street Journal just during the last week of the session, they closed 60 restaurants in the last year in, in San Francisco because of this. It is a, it, there's a, the two cities say we're the economic engine of the state. I think, therefore, it's hard for them to complain when the state says, well, then we're going to stick our nose into how you run your business. When you want money from us, you come down here saying you're the economic engine. When we want to tell you what to do, you say it's none of your business. <laughs> uh, one other thing happened on the budget. They got rid of something called ease. You never really knew what the budget of Missouri was when they left, because all these lines had ease by them, which meant estimate, which was just, and they'd put a $1 E, and that let the department just go off and spend money like crazy. It was a license to steal. This year, there are no E's anywhere in the budget, and so when you look at that budget, you know what Missouri's budget is for the next year, for the first time in... Uh, I, I think, think the Kansas yeah. legislature is operating with a great deal of ease, don't you? Uh, Given that example of what the ease mean? Yeah, I, I don't know if I would describe it as easy <laughs> over there <laughs> by any stretch of the imagination. So, All right, no. uh, uh, roads and bridges, they seem to be ignored, according to some people. Uh, do Missouri roads and bridges need attention? Oh, we definitely need attention. A uh, headline I saw, I captured this thing, it says, <clears throat> chaos, legislative session ends in chaos and accomplishment. Mm -hmm. Now, that, that's perfect. They fought, they argued, yep. some won, some lost. Nobody gets 100%. Greitens has got three more years to get more stuff done. <clears throat> and I think we we're well on our way. When you think about right to work, project labor agreement, judicial reform, Blue alert, tax credits, fully funding education. Wow, that's a win for Missouri. But and just the a level of division and explosiveness embarrassing. I mean, yeah. it is a little bit too much at times. Mm, not to me, well, because he's getting Democrats would just be quiet and be fine. Look at the national scene. Could yeah. Brighton be an uh, example? Smallest of number of bills passed in the last four uh, years. Yeah, some people judge the success of a legislature by how many, many yeah. questions, how many far issues it passed, number. others by how few. But is that few. relevant? Yeah, as long as me. he's <laughs> affecting, yeah, but he's affecting change. So let's look at him. He was supposed to be the change maker, okay. and let's compare him to the national. All right, speaking he's of change, he is getting things done. Yeah, speaking absolutely. of change, let's change topics. <laughs> the headline of an editorial in the May 11th Kansas City Star, delivered to my home in God's country, said, "Quote: Kobach gets Trump post suppressing vote." <laughs> well, that seemed odd. A commission to suppress voters. Wow. Then I read the same story on the Star's website. That headline said, and I quote, Kobach gets Trump post tasked with solving non-problem of voter fraud. The actual <laughs> statement from the White House press secretary says the new commission <laughs> will review practices that affect the integrity of federal elections, improper registrations, improper voting, fraudulent registrations, fraudulent voting, and voting suppression. Among the commission's members is Kansas Secretary of State Chris Kobach, who is vice chairman, the commission is headed by Vice President Mike Pence. Despite the Star's editorial board objections, is it not appropriate to find out if people who should not vote are voting and those who should are not being suppressed? I think everyone can agree that those who are not legally authorized to vote should not be doing so. And as an academic, I think it's reasonable to study anything. However, it's a matter... However... <laughs> 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 it's a matter of priorities and resources. And does it make sense to be 
putting resources into this right now. And I think what they're going to find is that it will probably be reflective of what Kobach found in Kansas. He has been in office now for the better part of seven years and has only had nine cases. Only one of those nine was an actual person who had uh, non-citizen status. The rest were largely confused seniors who had moved out of state. Why and are you so, looking at me when you say confused seniors? <laughs> no, no, no. No, no, no intention. You're a young spirit, Mike. I didn't mean anything there. But the, the old, by the way, but a young mind. spirit. Yeah. Old mind. When, when the data is examined, any credible examination of data in a variety of states has shown that it just doesn't happen very often. And the one study that some with concerns about vote fraud like to point to the 2014 Richmond et al. study, a partnership with Old Dominion and George Mason University faculty, unfortunately it was based largely on self-report data. They didn't verify non-citizen status. And if I could just indulge me, I'll quote from the article, a critical question for this project is whether Respondent's self-identification as non-citizens was accurate. If most or all of the non-citizens who indicated that they voted were in fact citizens who accidentally misstated their citizenship status, then the data would have nothing to contribute concerning the frequency of non-citizen voting. So that study is fatally flawed. I Academ think we got to find all those Ruskies right. who stole the election in Wisconsin. Have an interesting view of brevity. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so all right. right. I think it plays would the, the president be better served? if he would just drop these comments about illegals voting. This commission is the result of the president saying there were two, three million illegal people voting during the last election. That's why I didn't win the popular vote. I'm not sure that this study is going to confirm his beliefs. Yeah, I don't know that it will either, but I think the reality is it's been an issue for a long time in terms of illegal or fraudulent voting. And, and when you, what I look at, why do we put out this notion that voter suppression? Because when I hear that, I think of Bull Connor. I think of the yeah. 19th. Well, that's what it's 50s. supposed to mean. <clears throat> it's like, keeping minorities from that's voting. That's not going on. But I can tell you this voter records are, there's some problems there. A lot of people on the rolls that aren't living anymore. A lot of people on, and so there's, a, there's an environment there where you could see a real problem. Why not investigate it? <clears throat> uh, I think that going about it the way we are has created this hot negative, and it's part of the cover that the media puts out there that, <clears throat> excuse me, it's the, the intent don't let blacks and Hispanics vote. See, and I just, That's not I just what's going think on. the issue with voter fraud and voter, this whole conversation um, doesn't shed us in, in the current light in a great way. It sort of feeds into the narrative that one could say the liberal media is feeding, that Russia is coming into our elections, takes yeah. away from, no evidence on that, you know, either. everyone doing the real work. In the, in the House, in the Senate. There's nothing being done because the narrative is Russia came in and, you know, messed up the elections. Yeah, and now he sets a side. Yeah, and then yeah, he yeah. sets I, up a commission I, to go determine that. Uh, Less than 1%. How many times do we have to study it? Got to wrap this up about 20 seconds. Woody, uh, is this going to be good for Chris Kobach, who will no doubt run for governor next year in Kansas, and this kind of publicity, this national attention might help him? Spell his name right, I guess. Is my, you know, there's yeah. no He's such thing as it. bad press. It won't hurt him. It won't hurt him. It won't hurt him. And, uh, won't hurt him. Okay. and then it'll be affected by what is the, what's the result of the study. Yeah. Yeah. And it will be discredited regardless of what it right. is by, by people who don't think there's any reason to do this. Yeah, but it'll galvanize the space. Yeah. Okay. That's where he wins. Now we're going to head to the soapbox for Roast and Toast, where the Ruckheads have 30 seconds each to commend or offend <laughs> people and events in the news. And we start with Woody. Uh, I'm on toast to the Kent City Public Library, Crosby Kemper. They had uh, Condoleezza Rice at the downtown library last night. She has a new book out called Democracy. And in the course of it, she told a story of being in Birmingham when she was a little girl and Wallace was running for governor. And she drove by and all the African Americans were lined up to vote. And she said to her uncle, well, we're, Wallace is going to lose. Look at all. And he said, no, we're still the minority. He's going to win. And she said, so why do they bother? And he said, because someday their votes are going to count. And I, it was very inspirational to me. And for all of you out there who despair about the future of America, right behind love come faith and hope. And Condoleezza Rice's uncle and a lot of people had a lot of faith and hope. And guess what? It turned out all right in the end. The country ain't done for yet. A little Lisa. faith and hope. Lisa. 
a roast to the Kansas legislature who once again are waiting to the final minutes of the 11th hour to come up with appropriate tax policy. We don't need a debate about how many drinks to have at sporting events or who can have what kind of racetracks. Put your noses to the grindstone and get the tax policy finalized. All right, Cynthia. My toast is to former U.S. Ambassador Alan Katz. Um, he is the founder of a program called American Public Square, which finished its third season this last Monday. And he is determined to put back some civil discourse in the conversation as it results around politics and community <clears throat> issues. And for that, Mr. Uh, Katz, I say here, here. All right, Ron. I, I got a roast. I'm going to roast. Mayor James and this whole airport situation. Kansas City Business Journal. Kansas City lands on top 10 destination cities. <clears throat> That's from the journal, right? So we're doing fine. The airport's fine. We don't need to have this revolutionary change. It works. Let's stick with it. Okay, and finally, here is a roast to those suffering with Trump derangement syndrome, T <laughs> TDS. <laughs> A reflexive negative response to all things associated with the president. Most recently, the anger at the report in Time magazine that Trump gets two scoops of ice cream at White House dinners while guests get only one. And a new study that shows one out of every ten couples are ending their relationships because of Trump-related disagreements. <laughs> I don't know what the president would say to TDS victims or about them, but my guess is he would say, lock them up. Lock them up. And that is Ruckus for this week. We're back next Thursday at 7. Now for the Ruckets and the crew, Mike Shannon saying thanks very much for watching and good night.